All right. Good day, everyone. And thank you for joining us at today's client enrichment series presentation on policy and process changes for occupancy agreements. We have a great audience today and a great set of presenters who are looking forward to today's session. This is an encore session of our OASIS presentation from earlier this year in April. My name is Victor Mendez, and I'm a member of GSA's Client Enrichment Series team serving out of the Eagleton Courthouse in St. Louis, Missouri. I'll be serving as your host for today's installment for the Client Enrichment Series. Now, before we begin, I want to note that this session is being recorded. Uh, if you do not wish to continue in this session because it is being recorded, recorded, we completely understand. We are recording this session in order to post it online in our video library for any time viewing by PBS customers. Uh, you can find archived recordings of more than 50 previous client enrichment series sessions on topics uh, of a wide range on our YouTube channel. There is a link in the chat and at the end of today's slide deck to access those. Now, before we get into the material of today's presentation, a few housekeeping instructions. We have automatically muted your audio to help us control the sound quality of the presentation. If you are new to using Zoom, welcome. We have found that the Zoom for Government platform to be pretty intuitive and user-friendly. You can customize your view with the different pods as you see fit. Speaking of, you will see that there is a chat pod as well as a Q&A area. For this session, please use the chat pod for any administrative or logistical questions you have to report. Uh, as you are, or any issues that you're experiencing, and one of our CES team members can assist you. Um, as many of you already saw, that was how we can deal with uh, the chat being disabled. <laughs> uh, we ask that you use the Q&A pod uh, for any questions that are relevant to today's material. Uh, we will address some of these questions at the end of today's presentation, and the remainder will be answered uh, in a frequently asked questions document presented afterwards. For the folks who are participating by telephone only today, you can follow along with the slide deck uh, by emailing your question, and you can email your questions and comments to our mailbox at clientenrichmentseries at gsa.gov. And we'll make sure to get them on our questions list. Any other questions that we are unable to get to today, as stated, will be noted and answered on our website at www.gsa.gov slash CES. Uh, closed captioning for this event is available. Uh, to activate it, you can select an in uh, the in-window Zoom captioning by selecting the More button, it's three dots on your Zoom panel, and selecting View Subtitles. Today's presentation will be led by Lisa McCoy, Deanne Salazar, and Carlos Salazar. Lisa McCoy is a member of the National Rent Billing Office and is the business line lead for the development of a replacement to the OA tool, our new OASIS system. Lisa has been with GSA for 28 years, working in both Atlanta and Region 4, and in central office. Her previous experience ranges from the consolidation program, historic preservation, art and architecture, and regional data management, to serving as special assistant to two regional assistant commissioners. Next, we have Deanne Salazar, who works in the National Rent Billing Office on Customer Billing and GSA Policy. Deanne has been with GSA for 21 years, beginning in Region 6 in Kansas City, before moving to central office 16 years ago. And Carlos Salazar has been with GSA for 18 years and has served as the team lead for pricing in central office for over 12 years. He has been involved in various initiatives and teams, such as the Court Service Validation Initiative. Uh, he began his, GS career, his GSA career in Region 6 as an intern and soon after joined Portfolio Management. He holds a bachelor's degree in business administration from Trinity University and a master's in business administration from the University of Texas at San Antonio. While not one of our presenters, we also have Stephanie Gianni, uh, another expert from our National Rent Billing Office, who is going to be playing the role of Q&A Maven today. She'll be monitoring the Q&A pod closely during our session and will do her very best to respond to your questions in writing via that pod as the presentation goes along. And then, and then we'll help queue up the, rem the remaining questions at the end of our session. The presentation will run approximately 90 minutes with time afterward allotted for Q&A. Now, I will turn it over to our first present presenter. Lisa, you have the floor. Hello, and thanks everybody for joining us today and giving us uh, your time. Um, as Victor said, we, will, we have tried to anticipate as many questions as possible and to answer those in the slides. 
But for those we don't answer, Stephanie Ganey will be looking at our Q&A pod and we will be able to address those um, at the end of the session and anything we can't get to will be on the website. So first we want to give you a little bit of a background about what OASIS is, make sure we're all oriented. And the big things that we're gonna focus on this time are the improvements that are being made because of OASIS in our processes, which you'll see um, with our OAs and the related activities around it, the OA itself, um, some self-service that will become available to you as customers and um, an ease of release of space notices. There are also some pricing improvements and we'll be going through those and then again, have the Q&A at the end. So first we wanna see um, how much information people already have before we get started. Yes, we have our first poll question uh, asking, have you heard anything about Oasis before? Uh, and the option answers that will come up, uh, your poll question will come up on your screen. Uh, option A, yes, I attended the previous CES session on Oasis. Uh, two, yes, I've received some communication but haven't seen a presentation yet. And three, wait, what's Oasis? So go ahead and answer those questions in your due time. And let's see. Looks like we have a pretty good balance so far. It looks like all three options are pretty well represented in our audience thus far. So just get those answers in. And it looks like everyone has answered the question so far. And if for any reason you aren't seeing the poll pop up, uh, make sure to check the bottom of your Zoom module might be one of those options hiding in there. Um, or if you have any other issues, please put them in the chat. All right, that's fantastic information. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who said what's Oasis, um, this is GSA's new occupancy agreement and space inventory system to spell out Oasis. And it's going to replace uh, multiple systems. Our OA tool, which is where GSA creates the OAs that we um, become signatures signatories of and share with our customers um, to show the agreement for our rent. eSmart, which is how we uh, identify the assignment drawings for each agency and EOA, which some folks use now and it gives some views of the currently billing OAs. So since we're moving to this new system and we're replacing others, we wanted to take the opportunity to make improvements and not just recopy them onto a different format. So you'll see that there are a lot of changes, we think positive and improvements um, that will be coming because OASIS will be put in place. We are on schedule to go live on April 3rd, 2023. And you'll continue to get information from us as we get closer to that date. So before we talk about what's changing, just want to reassure everyone what is staying the same. Um, the OA is still the financial rent agreement with GSA, that is not changing. You can still get the OA, the improved OA, which you'll see as a downloadable PDF. So if you have a current internal process where you pass PDFs around for approval, you'll still be able to do that. Um, you still will have the CPAs uh, to use as project planning documents with estimates, and that will be early before your um, expiration. So you'll be able to get the general estimates uh, to plan for your future projects. Also rent test and rent on the web for those of you who use them, will still be available. And you will continue to have release of space rights that are easier to exercise. So what is changing? Um, we wanna improve the OA system and make it much more transparent and trackable. So we're going to have all OAs inside OASIS. So that means that the way that you'll receive your OAs from GSA will be changing and you will only receive them through OASIS so you will have to have users inside Oasis and we'll talk a little bit about that. So no more emailing, no more trying to make sure you've got the right version with what email. It will be in a queue for you to look at and approve. Um, you can still transfer um, the OA to others in your org um, with Oasis accounts for review. So if you need to do that, that will be an option for you. We're gonna test that with multiple agencies and make sure everybody's able to do that, but we are hoping that there aren't any issues with security um, processes on the end of that. Um, you will still um, have a timestamp for your eyes when they're approved, and you'll also know when it was sent to you, when someone took it into um, their control to look at and review and approve when it went back. All of those dates will be timestamped and you'll be able to look at the status at any point in time. 
we're not gonna have a physical signature or anything like DocuSign. We're gonna have a button that says approve. Um, and that is going to print the timestamp for when that OA was approved. Um, this is going to be a lot faster for everybody, extremely more organized and clearly more transparent than we have now. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit um, about user roles as you'll, we go through the process. Each agency will have to determine who is going to be authorized to press that approve button to sign the OA. Based on your feedback, we've also added three fields on the OA record. These are open fields, three of them that you can use for anything that you would like or not use at all. Um, and this is based on feedback that it would help um, our customers to be able to put their um, agency region in or some notes or some other identifying information um, that is outside of what GSA keeps track of. And that will allow you as it's now a field to be able to sort and run reports based on that information. And we think that that's gonna be very useful. Um, you will also be able to see all of your rent rates, including past and future rates that are available. And you can get to that at any time. So GSA um, looked at Oasis and thought, well, while we're doing this big change, let's kind of take a step back and look at everything and see what can we improve. So we focused on our processes, the OA itself, providing more self-service to you, um, making release of space notices easier. And we looked at our pricing policy and said, are there any policies that we need to improve or streamline? Um, how will you guys get into Oasis? So this is gonna be directly through a web browser. So you're just gonna go to your browser, type in the address. You don't have to install anything. Um, nothing has to be set up for you. Unfortunately for security reasons, since this is a new system, if you are an EOA or um, run on the web user, Unfortunately, we can't just transfer those user roles over to Oasis. We will need people to um, request a user role, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and there'll be more details as we get closer to go live. Um, the user roles are assigned by AB code. So if you're someone who works with multiple AB codes, that's perfectly fine. You'll just identify that when you're signing up for Oasis. So GSA is coordinating at a leadership level um, to make sure that everyone is clear on what needs to happen and what users each agency is going to want to have in the system. Um, we'll start identifying those names in the first quarter of FY23. There's, for security reasons, a two-step process to be able to become an OASIS user. The first is to go to max.gov and have a max.gov account. Um, and that verifies that you're a, a current valid federal employee. Um, and that needs to happen before you can get into OASIS. But you don't have to do that now. We just wanna make you aware that there is a two-step process in order to get in. Once you become an OASIS user, your agency will have the ability to add, delete, modify a role for any of your AB codes um, folks that are in there as users. So you will have that control. And as with any other system, there is a security requirement that if you're not active in OASIS for 90 days, your account will automatically be disabled, um, but you will be able, if you do need to come back in, to be able to, to ask for that to be reactivated. So from the agency side, you're gonna have folks who just want to look at the OAs, wanna run some reports. Um, you might have separate people who want to submit your releases of space. Um, and we'll also have the ability to ask a billing question about your OA that we will track. So you can either submit your release of space or ask a question and you'll be able to see that question go through the answer process um, as we process it. When we look at who's approving an OA for your agency, we call those ordering officials. Many of them might be the same people that are signing OAs now, but this is an opportunity for you to think within your agency about who's the most appropriate person for that or people for that. Um, should you have less people, more people? What, how does that affect how you want to get your OAs approved? The way it works is when GSA sends over an OA, there's going to be a queue of people that have been given the ordering official rights from their agency to be able to approve an OA. Now you have to grab that OA when it comes in in order to review it and approve it. So as an agency, you'll need to decide, you know, do we have geographic um, differences and we want to say these three people only approve OAs from this region and these two from this other region? Or are you smaller and you can have two people who are capable of approving OAs for, from any location? Um, there's a lot of ways that you can do that, but you want to think about 
um, who do we want to put in charge of having that official approve pressing um, requirement? Um, and you don't just have the option to approve. You can also look at that and say, oh, no, this needs to be Mary. Um, you can reassign that to another ordering official. And also, if there's something on there that isn't quite making sense, you can send it back to GSA in the system and request a clarification. Uh, so we can make sure that there's any uncertainty that we can get that cleared up. And again, each agency needs to identify who your authorized approvers are. Now, the person pressing the button may or may not be the final authority as far as you may have a director or someone else that looks at the OA and says, okay, it's fine. Um, I would sign this if we were still doing physical signatures. You can go ahead and press the approve button. So, of course, that person um, pressing the approve button doesn't have to have all of the decision making power, but they need to be responsible to answer to someone um, who has that power. And um, the agencies, you know, you need to understand that that person is responsible for pressing the approve button. If something's signed or emailed or somewhere else, it's not going to count. We need to have it in the system so that we can all track the status and we can track all the information about the OAs. Now we're going to be um, talking with your POCs and we'll um, have some additional discussion about that, um, about who specifically should be your, your OA approvers. Now there's a wide variety in our agencies. Some are small and may only have one or two OAs. Some are very large and need several, several people to be able to handle um, the number of OAs that they have come into their queue. So on average, we're just estimating, we think overall it'll be about five um, per AB code, but that doesn't mean if you're a large agency, you can't have more than that. We just wanted to give everybody a sense of what we're kind of assuming going in um, that every agency on average would have about five, or that's the total number that we think we're gonna need uh, for ordering official licenses. Uh, we will be providing user access instructions in November and December. So again, you don't need to do anything now, just know that those um, instructions are coming. We will have them posted on our site and we'll be spreading um, the user information widely as we get closer. Just know that there'll be two steps that you need to follow. And we will have online training available in January and February of 2023. This will be for your general read-only users, but also some very specific training for those ordering officials and those that need to move the OA through their internal process. And now Carlos is going to talk to us about process improvements. Thank you so Hi, much, Carl. Lisa. I think we actually have Victor kick us off with another poll question. Yes, thank you very much, sir. Uh, poll question number two on the next slide here. Uh, do you currently review or approve OAs? Again, this is a poll question that should be popping up. If it isn't, take a look at the bottom of your module and make sure that you're able to answer this question. And it looks like we're having a slight majority of uh, customers on this call who do currently review or approve occupancy agreements, uh, but we do have about 40% who do not at this time. And with that in mind, Carlos, take it away. Thank you so much. Well, only 4% didn't know what, what an OA was, so that's, that's not bad, but we'll see if we can get that up to, uh, to or down to zero. <laughs> uh, so along with the development of OASIS, GSA took the opportunity to look at all our existing processes to find opportunities to streamline and improve the customer experience. Naturally, the first thing we looked at was our OA process, our, occupancy agreements. We found that using draft OAs early on in the project was causing issues because uh, they relied on early estimates and that necessarily meant that there was gonna be multiple revisions resulting in an overwhelming volume of OAs versions being sent to our customers for review, signature, and customers were even having a hard time understanding why they were getting them in the first place. We realized that it was really too early to sign an OA at the outset of the project because customers don't have 
any financial commitment until GSA makes an award anyway per our own pricing policy. And finally, we found that draft OAs were unnecessary because we're already providing planning and budgeting information through our client project agreements, CPAs, and the GSA rent estimate. So with our new system and process, OAs will be created and based on best and final offers, or in leases, what we call final proposal revisions, not estimated amounts. When you get an OA, it will reflect accurate, up-to-date information on your occupancy. Now, we're really excited about this because it's going to improve the clarity and transparency of your project and reduce the repeated updates and revisions to OAs that, that currently inundate you. Now, since GSA will be creating OAs based on a final offer, when you see an OA requiring approval in OASIS, that means there's either a pending lease award or a construction award. Therefore, it is important for you to review and approve the OA in a timely manner to keep that procurement on track. Now, in our current OA process, this is often referred to as an award OA. What's different is that in our new process, this is when the OA will first be created. And most projects will only require this one OA approval. However, if there is a change in the project impacting the rent, such as additional tenant improvements to be amortized, we'll then request approval again through, through OASIS. Now with that, I'll actually, oh, Next slide, yeah. Now, uh, <laughs> rest assured that while GSA is changing the timing of when we create and send OAs to right before award, we understand there's still a need to communicate project information to you right from the outset of the project. So this will happen initially through the CPA, that client project agreement, and during the project, we'll keep communicating with you the latest costs and other project info through project, meeting, project meetings and updates. There is a GSA team working on standardizing what that project communication will look like uh, so that you can get the, know what to expect with the, the latest and greatest info on your project. And I think you'll see that as kind of a recurring theme throughout this presentation is that standardization along with simplicity and consistency is uh, what we've tried to achieve with all our process improvements. Now with that, I'll turn it over to Deanne to talk about additional OA process improvements. Thanks, Carlos. Um, so Lisa mentioned this and I want to dig in deeper to kind of some of the details about moving the OA process into OASIS. Um, I think this is kind of the biggest uh, improvement for both us and, and you as customers. Um, so we're really excited to kind of see what this gives us as, as far as some efficiency gains and just making a more organized um, and trackable and accountable system. So right now, if you're familiar with the OA process, um, someone at GSA creates the OA and then attaches it to an email and sends it over to their agency um, counterpart. Uh, they might also copy an agency mailbox if your agency has set one of those up. Um, but other than that, it's just between those personal inboxes. Um, so if you needed to review where that OA was, you needed to find the person that it got sent to and have them forward it to you. Um, if someone went on vacation, we kind of had a delay or, or maybe a lost OA as we tried to track down where that had been. And there was really no way for you or us to kind of have insight on whether an OA had been sent or whether it was being reviewed or had come back approved, um, as well as what version, um, if you were someone getting multiple versions of an OA, to kind of sift through where you were in the process. This added a ton of time on our side and I'm sure it added a lot to yours. Um, so moving forward, that whole system comes into OASIS. And what that means is that 
we will still be creating that OA record. And then we will be pushing a button which sends it to you um, through OASIS. You'll receive notices um, and alerts when there is something that needs your review and, and approval. But when you get that, like Lisa outlined, it's gonna go to your queue of users. So anyone with that AB code right will be able to see, we've gotten an OA for GSA, it's for this project. And then you can decide who's the best person to take and review that OA. Um, if that person goes on vacation or, or opens one and says, oh, actually this is, this is somebody else's, you can reassign work, you can move things around. And then if someone else needs to see, what's the status of that? Did we get back to GSA? I was just in a meeting and they mentioned this OA. You'll be able to open it and see, yep, we've actually approved it or no, we haven't. So all of that becomes incredibly trackable. Um, it's always available and then you can run reports. So if you're someone involved in the OA or rent process, you are probably a very big data enthusiast. Um, so once this is all in OASIS, you can run reports on every field and every status. So you can see how many OAs have we approved this year? How many are pending? How many do we normally get? What's the status? Um, and you'll be able to do that for your AB code um, on demand whenever you're ready to do that. Um, like I said, you will be receiving notices in the system of when that um, action is happening. We do recognize that for some of you, um, this may change how you currently review OAs. Um, you'll still have the capacity to pass them around internally. You'll still have the capacity to decide who is going to actually approve them. Um, but it is potentially going to kind of change those shared mailboxes or some of those um, lines of communication you've put into place. Um, and as we get later in this process through the fall and winter, um, we'll discuss those in a lot more detail as you kind of set up your process um, for reviewing these. Um, like Lisa said, um, we are trying to be very careful with our language now. Um, we are moving away from what we call a signed OA and moving to an approved OA. Um, we will still have, those will be time stamped. They will be documented. When you print out um, that OA document, it will say whether or not it is approved and the date and the time and who did it. Um, but it just gets away from having to do a wet signature or a DocuSign signature, attach it to a, an email and shift it back. So throughout this presentation and, and throughout the next year, um, you will hear us talk about OA approvers and approving the OA. Um, like Lisa mentioned, we want to highlight this again. Um, this was the result of, of some feedback we've gotten from you guys um, through the years. You'll have three additional fields for every OA that are open text fields that you can use to add identifying information that is specific to your agency. Um, whether maybe your regions are aligned a little bit differently than GSA and you want to say, Sure, it's a region GSA 4 OA, um, but it's our region 5. You can enter a 5 in there. Um, if you want to track different offices, so maybe it's your office of, of mission assurance and you want to put that in the note so that when someone says, can we pull up all the rent for, for our mission assurance office, you can do that. Um, so it's open to whatever you all want to put in it. It's completely controlled by you. You can edit it later. Um, you can not use it. You can um, set up whatever kind of controls you want, but then they become reportable and trackable for your, for your information. Um, and then finally, when you're looking at that OA and reviewing it, you'll also be adding your own headcounts. Um, this is something that we've tracked for the last decade. Typically you provide the information to GSA, we type it into our system. Um, it's somewhat available in the back end for you to look at later. Um, we use it for reporting, um, but we're just going to cut out that middleman. You guys um, are best capable to tell us what your headcounts are, so you'll be able to enter those um, directly. And if you need to update them um, throughout the life of the OA, you can do that on your end. Um, so this next screen, I know on a, a presentation, it's a little harder to see than, than if it was um, in the system, um, but this is what that approval screen looks like. Um, circled here in red, you can kind of see we have those three agency headcount fields um, that you can complete, and then those custom identifiable fields. They're long, so you'll probably want to come up with, with an idea about how much information you want to put in that custom identifier, um, but you've got a lot of real estate to work with there. And so when you go ahead and click this and, and hit continue, um, your OA kind of moves into that approved status. Um, so this is a sneak peek of, of what it will look like when you're in the, in the system. 
So along with those process improvements, we've also taken the opportunity to improve the OA document itself. Um, so there you go. Um, so those of you that, that may not be familiar, um, the document dates from 2004 and was based on a document format from 1997. So for some of us, that seems like just the other day, um, but it is in fact 25 years old at this point. Um, and it was time to improve the document and, and kind of bring it into a more user-friendly um, format. Uh, part of what is in the OA now, um, if you are not familiar with it, is about six pages of boilerplate text um, that may or may not apply specifically to the occupancy in question. Um, and it was information that was selectively pulled from the pricing desk guide. So it was not all inclusive um, and it, it did not cover every occupancy situation. Within that paragraph, we also had important um, information about your occupancy, such as um, location or term or, or the size of it, um, how many parking spots you had. And it was kind of difficult, we heard from some folks to, to read through that and kind of parse out those important details. And then the financial pages that followed um, the, the paragraph boilerplate language um, were typically 10 to 20 pages long. There was one page for each fiscal year. And that showed the annual rent that you would pay. So if you had a rate that was turning over in the middle of that fiscal year, you saw the blended rate. Um, maybe you're paying $10 for the, the first part of the year and $15 later, that OA would show $12.50. Um, if you tried to compare it against your rent bill, it would get a little confusing because you'd say, well, we're only paying $10 now. We think we're underpaying. And then later in the month, you would say, oh, do you say, um, you know, we think we're overpaying now. Um, those calls came a little more frequently than the underpaying calls. Um, but this um, was kind of a defect, I think, with, with the current format. Um, and then we had some inconsistencies in those ad hoc clauses um, that we needed to address. So going forward, all of that boilerplate text has been removed. Um, it was either added to the pricing desk guide or like I said, most of it was already part of the pricing desk guide. We just kind of clarified or made the language a little bit more consistent um, where we needed to do that. that paragraph format has really been simplified into a table format. So you can get used to quickly looking through and, and saying, yep, here's my square footage, here's my parking, here's my dates. Um, it also makes it reportable um, and trackable when it's put into those table formats. All of your rates are gonna be shown with an effective and an expiration date. Um, so you will be able to see on that OA, um, yes, I have a shell rate of $10 through April, and then I'm going to have a shell rate of $15 starting in May. And you'll be able to use that to more quickly validate your rent that you're paying in real time. We also have some blending of rates um, that happen as a result of having different blocks of space. So maybe you have a, a third floor office um, that's billing at $20 and you expanded at some point and, and we got space on the 20th floor and that's $40. Um, the way the current format is set up, um, we would have to blend those rates together and show what the composite shell would be um, for that space. That will still be true on row. If you are combining multiple blocks of space, your monthly rent bill will still only show one shell rate line, for example. However, on the OA itself, you can look and say, oh, okay, that's 10,000 square feet at, at this amount and 20,000 square feet at this other amount and kind of use that um, to better track your occupancies and your costs. Um, and then the majority of the clauses have been removed. Um, there are three main ones that we are keeping, um, broker commission credits, free rent, and agency funded shell will remain if they apply to your specific occupancy, um, but the rest of them are, are, are gone. Um, so in the next slide here, we wanna kind of make sure that everybody understands that um, this does mean that we will not have ad hoc clauses or agency specific clauses anymore. The reasons for this um, are kind of threefold. Um, first of all, a lot of this information that we're putting in clauses is because we didn't have another way to show it on the OA document. And now that you have access to all of the information, all the fields, and we've moved all of that information 
into the document, um, we don't need to call out specific TI amount because it's called out elsewhere. Um, we don't need to call out the blending of space because you can see that um, represented in the rate lines. Um, so most of them were no longer needed for that reason. The other issue that we kind of have though, um, deals with, with national consistency. Um, this is a formal interagency agreement um, documenting your occupancy and rent, and we need that to be consistent. So we don't want situations where in one, in one state you're seeing it with, with additional clauses or, or terms that you're not seeing in other states. Um, and unfortunately, Throughout the years, we have had cases um, where someone will put a clause in there um, that deviates from our pricing policy, and the person that, that put the clause in did not have the authority to do that. Um, we, have, we have ways to, to deviate from our pricing policy when we need to, um, but those generally require much higher approvals, sometimes up to the commissioner and administrator level. Um, and when they were put into ad hoc clauses, we kind of had to go back and correct those and, and walk some of those back. And I know that that was a really frustrating situation for customers. So um, we're avoiding that potential pitfall going forward and, and ad hoc clauses won't be allowed. Um, I will say real fast, removing those clauses, though, we have not removed your rights. Um, so just because there's not a non cancelable clause, you still have cancellation rights. Um, in fact, you'll see whether or not it's cancelable directly on that OA. Um, any rights you had in the pricing desk guide, you continue to have. It's just that it's um, codified in the pricing desk guide instead of your individual um, OA document. So sneak peek, here's a look at that OA summary, um, the new document. Again, I know it's a little hard to see on the screen. We will share a copy on our website and make sure we send one out to folks. Um, but this is a generic one that was put together um, for this meeting. So you can kind of see that the top section gives that general information. Um, what's my OA number? Is this cancelable? Um, all those customer identifiers that you guys may have entered um, show up there. Then you get your location information, your space, um, square footage parking. And then on this next screen, you can kind of see the rest of the document. This is your financial information. And this is how it's broken down now. Instead of separate pages um, for each fiscal year, you'll get it all here broken out by rate. Um, so you can see that each rate will show you the monthly amount, the annual amount, the cost um, per square foot or per parking, um, and then what that works out to as a start and end date. Um, if you have TI that is billing, you'll see the principal amount, the interest rate, the duration, you'll see all of that here um, in your financial information. The document in most cases um, will be around two uh, pages long. If you're an agency that um, for some reason, a location that has a lot of blending of space or has a lot of step rents, um, it could go longer as we put each and every one of those step rents in there um, or blended spaces in there. Um, but in general, it will be about a page and a half to two pages. And then on the bottom, it would appear if you had approved it, um, names and dates. So um, I know that was a lot of information um, and it's a kind of a new look and, and a new document to get used to. Um, but one of the really nice things is that while the OA document can be PDF, can be printed out, can be saved um, in your in your personal files uh, that you keep as an agency, um, you're also going to get an amazing amount of direct access to data. And that comes in in this customer agency self-service. So we'll pause right, right here for a quick poll. Yes, let's give uh, our presenters a chance to catch their breath. Uh, this next poll question, are you currently a user of our EOA tool? You have option one, yes, frequently, at least monthly. Number two, yes, occasionally, at least quarterly. Number three, yes, but only rarely, at least yearly. Or four, uh, no, what is an EOA? when we have a lot of people who are asking about what an EOA is. And it looks like, aside from that, it's really across the board in terms of how frequently folks are um, using EOA tools. Ah, that's another good consideration from chat. Some people know what an EOA is, but they don't know how to use it. Well, I think that we're about to gain some very useful information on that as our presentation continues. 
We had one more poll question here, Victor. There is another poll question. I see it. Um, <laughs> our next poll question. Are you currently a user of our rent on the web ROW tool? Number one, yes, frequently, at least monthly. Number two, yes, occasionally, at least quarterly. Number three, yes, but only rarely, at least yearly. And number four, no, what is rent on the web, on the web slash ROW? And it seems here we have a good fraction of people who are familiar with and use this uh, rent on the web pretty frequently, but we still have a large portion who don't know what rent on the web is. I'll now pass it back to the presenters as we continue our presentation. That's really helpful for us to kind of gauge where folks are at and what tools um, you're most comfortable with or, or not using. Um, so I will start and say the dashboards will remain, rent on the web will still be available, users that have access to it will continue to have access to it, um, that is not going away. However, if you want the bright, shiny new thing, um, Oasis will have all of that data in that self-service portal. Um, so at any time on demand, when you need the information, you can go into Oasis and you'll be able to directly view your OA records. Um, you can open up an OA by OA number and say, okay, what's the square footage right now? What's the rent? Is there future rent? Um, when is this TI gonna be done? What are the terms of this? What is going on? Um, you can grab all of that information. For those of you that run a lot of analytics for um, your entire agency or an entire region, um, you can download that information, whether it's for um, a subset of search criteria or if it's just everything and you want to uh, sort and filter and, and play around with that data. Um, so you'll have that access. Um, if someone calls you for an audit or you're having to do a rent review, um, you can go in and within an hour have everything you need instead of having to reach out to GSA and try to get that information um, consolidated and sent back. You're also going to be able to view your OA history. Um, this becomes more important as as we move on through OASIS, um, but you'll be able to kind of go in and say, when, when did that OA expand? When did that version change? I know there's a lot of issues around OA versioning right now. Um, those are um, fixed immensely with the new system, but you will be able to go through and say, okay, so, you know, I was being built 10,000 square feet. Now I'm being built 8,000. When did that happen? Um, what did that look like? When was it approved? Um, for your owned space, if you're in a federally owned building by GSA, you'll also be able to download your assignment drawings in PDF. Um, we'll have leases in there linked um, if you are in a leased location. And like Lisa mentioned before, you can also use this portal to ask a question about your rent bill. Um, so if you notice that something odd happened last month or you're not sure why something happened and can't figure it out from the data, you're able to send GSA a question through the tool and we'll be able to kind of collect that information, see what kind of frequently asked questions we get, um, make sure that you're getting timely responses. And then finally, um, which is kind of a, a timelier topic, but you'll be able to submit releases of space notice uh, directly through OASIS. Um, so all of that's gonna be available to you um, once you guys get in and start kind of testing and playing around with it. Um, you know, you'll be able to see how you can kind of customize it or, or how you can use that data um, to change how you've been kind of reviewing your, your data. And it should give you a lot more transparency um, into that rent bill. All right, releases of space. So the release of space process, like the OA approval process, is going to be brought into OASIS. So for those of you that are involved in the process now, um, you provide a written notice to GSA based on your release of space rights. Um, and that release goes to our central mailbox, hopefully. Um, it gets manually tracked. We kind of enter it into a spreadsheet so that we can pull some data and analysis. Sometimes they don't get sent to that mailbox. They get sent to an individual, maybe at the field office, maybe at the region or national. And we have to kind of um, chase it around to get it in the right place. Um, that is going to change with OASIS. 
We will obviously have a short transition period so that um, if you're you know, submitting your release today for a, a release in May, um, or you need to submit a release right there in April, um, we'll kind of allow that, that two-prong approach um, initially. But once we get through that transition period, um, we will not be able to accept any other release notices unless they are submitted through OASIS. Um, they can be for the entire space if you are completely relocating, or it can be a partial space release. Um, and we're going to have options in there if it is a partial release of space where you can go in and drill down to the exact spaces you're releasing. Um, you don't have to if you, for some reason, um, don't have that data handy or need some of that uh, GSA assistance, you can still say it's the fourth floor. I don't know what that looks like, you know, please just, it's the fourth floor. Um, but if you have that data, if it's someone in the building that says, I want to give back this suite, this suite, and, and this space, you can um, indicate that. And that way you're getting some real data about what that would look like from a rent perspective. So when you submit that to GSA, it will come over to us and we'll go through the same process that we do now when we review a release of space um, request and make sure that it conforms with our pricing policy um, and that that space is releasable. Assuming it is, um, we approve it right there in the system and you as the agency get that notice. So again, if anyone in your agency needs to know about pending space releases, you can open OASIS and see, yes, these are the ones that have been accepted. These are the ones that are pending. These are the ones that have recently completed. That request is going to remain open and in a pending status until you actually move out. Um, I know that sometimes um, releases are one of those things where the dates change a lot sometimes. Um, maybe your, your future project is delayed. Um, maybe the move couldn't get organized quite in time. Um, maybe for some other reason you gave us your release very early on. And, and now as you're getting down to the wire, um, you realize that you need to extend that. That's all fine. Um, what this gives us the ability to do is keep that release open and update that move out date as we need to. Um, and then we'll get notifications in the system when people are um, notified that in a month, this space is supposed to be um, vacant. Are we on track for that? Are we, can we confirm that? Do we need to extend the date so we keep this information accurate? Um, and then once we do that, we'll enter the date directly in there and you will see it close in your bill. Um, reduce. It's going to improve the efficiency of the entire release process. Um, it's also going to ensure that we have those timely billing updates. I know nothing is more frustrating than when you release space, but you still see it on your bill for a month or two. Um, this is going to allow us to track it a lot more closely. And it's also going to allow you at, if you're someone who views this data at a national level, to understand why something got delayed. So um, maybe you're, you're managing a release that's being done by one of your field offices, you notice it's still on the bill the next month and you're wondering why is this still on the bill, you'll be able to go in and see, okay, it's still on the bill because the date had to get extended. So it's not late, um, it's just been delayed versus this says we moved out, we know we moved out, it's still on the bill, we need to, we need to submit that request to GSA and let them know right away. Um, so it's gonna improve that process um, as we look towards releases. All right, so enough from me. I will turn it back to Carlos who can highlight all of the pricing policy changes um, that we're implementing uh, in conjunction with OASIS. Thank you so much. Now, before so, we dive yeah. into Carlos's next section, uh, we have another poll question for the audience. Uh, this one is how familiar are you with PBS's pricing policy or the pricing desk guide? Option number one, very familiar, I use it all the time. Option two, somewhat, I know where to find it when I need it. Number three, not very, I know it's out there but never view it. And number four, what is that? And this time it looks like the majority of people either know where it is when they need it or don't really use it and don't know where it is, only that it exists and is out there. And Carlos, uh, at your leisure, go ahead. Great, that is good info. 
So um, the fundamentals of GSA pricing policy are still the same in that lease space is priced as the underlying lease contract plus the fee. And when you're in a federal building, the space is priced via appraisal or in special circumstances, like if you're in a land port of entry on the, on the border via return on investment pricing. However, we realized that with OASIS, we had an opportunity to reevaluate how we price and bill certain aspects of our space to simplify, simplify things and provide consistency where appropriate. Now, all these pricing policy changes we're talking about will be reflected in our soon to be released sixth edition of the pricing desk guide. So be on the lookout for that, but let's jump right in. Now, uh, the first policy change is standardizing how we escalate operating costs in our federal buildings. So please note this change does not affect uh, your lease space. Now, currently, <clears throat> excuse me, Currently, for an OA in a federal building, the operating cost component of your rent escalates based on the anniversary date of the OA. And this causes a lot of uncertainty for uh, confusion for our customers of when their rent's gonna change. Uh, about half of those are actually tied to the fiscal year, but the other half, you know, who knows if you can remember when that OA first started. Now, what we are doing is standardizing that the operating costs will escalate at the beginning of the fiscal year in October, providing you with additional predictability for when those rent changes will occur. Now you'll see this change implemented at the start of FY23, which we're just on the cusp of. And uh, similarly, we are also standardizing how we escalate parking costs in our federal buildings by having, uh, those also standardize at the beginning of the fiscal year and use the same OMB escalation factor that we use for our operating costs. Now, one thing to note is that parking cost escalation change will actually be implemented in FY24. So just over one year from now. Now, another change that we're making is with tenant improvements. Now, if you're familiar with the, the tenant improvements or the tenant improvement allowance, that's what GSA provides to customers to fund their build out of space. In your current OA, you'll see the TI amortized into your rent and it's broken into two components, general and custom. Now, in our new OA that Deanne showed you, those are combined into a single TI line. Now, what is great about this is, is it just helps simplify and understand what, what it is you're paying rather than, than breaking it out and to understand what, what that total TI amount is. We're also billing um, uh, on a monthly amount, not a rate per square foot like, like we currently had in, in the past. And this is great because it maintains a consistent payment amount and avoids the confusion that can happen when your square footage changes as it, as it does throughout the occupancy. And then you might be wondering, why did my TI rate change? Or was there some project that I was unaware about that, that impacted the rent? By billing as a monthly amount and not as a rate, that amount stays the same. Now, another change with TIs is that when you're approving your OAs, uh, in, in Oasis, you're going to be authorizing the principal amount of the TI and the maximum amortization term. The benefit here is that the OA then is not subject to reapproval when there's minor rounding differences uh, in the rates, or maybe there's a minor project delay. So, for example, instead of amortizing your tenant improvements over 120 months, maybe it's 118 months because that that project took a couple more months than, than we thought it would to come online. Now, you as the customer would have authorized us to spend a maximum amount over a maximum amortization term. So we are good to go and we're no longer having to inundate you with additional OA versions that have little or no value. 
Now, another change that we've made is standardizing how GSA implements our drawing reviews, or what you've heard referred to as spatial data measurement or SDM reviews. To be clear, what we're talking about is not when you expand or release space to us. It's instead when GSA updates the assignment drawings for your space, and that may result in square footage changes. So this only impacts, again, our, our federal buildings for, for this change. And for example, if you have a room that's not actually 525 square feet like we thought it was, turns out it's actually 530 square feet uh, when we've uh, correctly you know, placed all the, the polylines and, and such in, in our drawings, that that's what we're talking about here. How we dealt with those changes in our old process we involved at least two steps and was quite frankly cumbersome and at the very little, very least required a blending of rates that people found confusing and a changing of rates several times uh, and multiple versions of OAs. With our new process, we're going to share and notify you of any measurement changes to budget cycles in advance, but we're not going to update the OA until the October following that time to budget period. So this keeps things very simple. It reduces the volume of OAs that, that you get when the, there's these kind of changes and we're still giving you notice through OASIS to give you plenty of time to budget. Now, another change is we have standardized your continued occupancy and lease space, uh, which currently kind of falls under you know, several different policies and workarounds for, for OAs. But uh, going forward, when you continue to occupy lease space, so let's say GSA has done either an extension, a lease renewal, or a succeeding lease, or maybe we competed the procurement, but good news, you're getting to, to stay in place. So if you continue to occupy that, that lease space, you will not be required to approve an OA to continue to use your space. GSA will continue to bill you the pass-through amount uh, of the underlying lease contract that we negotiated pl plus the fee. Uh, so in, in a nutshell, if you continue to occupy space, lease space, you should continue to expect to, to pay for it. And we are not going to send you a new OA for that, for that reason. Only in the case of if there is a non-cancelable assignment or we're amortizing additional TI into your OA, or if there's been an ex space expansion, additional square footage uh, for your space, that's when GSA will ask for, for OA approval. All right, now with that, we'll move to the other change that uh, we're calling open-ended federal occupancy terms. So what this means is that in your OAs for, for federal buildings, they, they will no longer have an expiration date, at least for, for, most of our, for, for most of our occupancies. So this means that we'll no, no longer have those continuing occupancies that, that we send you at the end of a rate term when we have found that almost all our customers tend to, to stay in space, uh, in their space once, once they're in the building. Sure, there's expansions, there, there are releases, and you still have your release of space rights. In fact, they'll, they'll actually be improved um, to, to release whenever you need, you need to do that kind of reduction, but you're no longer having OAs sent to you just for that purpose uh, when, the, when they expire. And this really, again, reflects how our agencies occupy and use the space when we know that you have a short-term need due to your mission and that you are going to be moving out. We will have a, a move-out date to, to, reflect, to reflect that reality. Now, what is so great about this is that um, it, we move away for, from our current process to where you might have multiple OAs uh, in, in a federal building. And because those rates are tied to when 
that those OAs created, you'll see that you could have OAs in the same building um, in the same fiscal year that have different rates and it's not due to different TI. So what we're moving towards is having um, a, a, a universal building rate that will apply to all your OAs in, in that building so that you can have a lot of clarity and transparency over what, what those rates should be. Okay, well, with that, I wanna point you to that we do have our OASIS website at uh, gsa.gov listed here on the screen, as well as a uh, group inbox directly for PBS OASIS questions. These are both resources for all of you that you can use and reach out if you have uh, questions. And uh, I, I'm sure you, uh, you have money, which uh, we'll, we'll get to here shortly. But uh, please, that pbsoasis at gsa.gov uh, to, to submit any questions. And keep in mind, like uh, Deanne and Lisa mentioned, we, you should expect to see emails from there to uh, uh, have action on your part to identify who, you, who your POCs are going to be as we do this rollout to, to Oasis. And we definitely want you to start thinking about how this new change in policies and processes were gonna affect you and your agency and how maybe you have to make changes on how you review the, those OAs. In uh, the first quarter here, 23, we will actually be requesting specific uh, usernames uh, for, for POCs and roles. And like Deanne mentioned, we'll be having that uh, training in the second quarter uh, on, on OASIS to get everyone up to speed and know how to do, review and approve everything that you'll be seeing. So with that, I think we'll jump right into, I see we've got uh, several questions that I think, uh, I, I know we've answered uh, as we've gone along, um, but yes, let's we see. Have, uh, we have Carlos, we've, we had a lot of great questions. Most of them were able to be answered, um, but I just had one that I wanted to kick over to the team. Will we continue to get a copy of the actual lease for commercial occupancies and will it be accessible through OASIS? Yes, you will. Um, the leases, um, we have a field within our um, OA record where we can add additional documents and we can link that um, lease right in there. So the lease will actually be with the OA and when you open the OA, you can get to the lease and they'll be paired together um, forever. So it'll help us, I think, with some of our document management, and hopefully it'll help you guys find those quickly and easily. Thanks. We had another really techie question that I wasn't sure the answer actually, and, and Lisa or Deanne, this one's going to be for you as well. This is about the three customizable fields in the OA. So agencies will be able to have these three sort of open fields that they can use for whatever they want or not at all, you know, completely optional. But the question was, um, will these agency customizable fields allow for a custom label by the agency? So will they, the agencies be able to say, you know, this is our org code or this is, you know, an accounting code or will they just have to use field one, field two, field three? So when we go live, it will have to be field one, field two, field three. And you can set up whatever kind of controls within the agency to say we only use field one for this or that. Um, that doesn't mean we can't put it on the list of things to look at um, for future enhancements. I've written it down. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, yes. Um, I do wanna go back towards the sort of the beginning of the presentation when we were talking about CPAs. We had um, quite a few questions about CPAs, of course. Um, this is a bit of a change because people are used to getting draft OAs right now. So if we could talk a little bit more about that, how, how are agencies going to get a copy of their CPA? Who are they gonna get that from? And are those documents going to be living documents, if you will? 
That's a good question. It's a little bit outside of our swim lane. So we can provide some information today and then we can follow up with the customer engagement team that manages CPAs um, and have them provide some more information. Um, in general, the process will look the same that it does now. You should be receiving CPAs for your projects today. Um, they're typically sent to the customer counterpart who is helping to manage the project and make those strategic requirement decisions. Um, we can get you more specific information on who in a particular region is getting or agency is getting them um, after the call if, if there's someone that would like that information. It is, is an iterative document, but not a living document. So I think that that is kind of the important thing to keep in mind. Um, the format will continue as it does today, that you get the, the part one at the very early strategic requirements, and then you get the part two when you've kind of narrowed it down, and, and that provides that estimated rent and space information. Um, that is not continuously updated, though. So it's based on the estimates at that time. Um, up until we get to that lease award stage, uh, then you will get your OA, which will have the actual bid amounts. Um, so between those two periods of the CPA um, and the OA, that's where you'll have that project communication. Um, for those that are familiar with the Kahua tool, there's some things that they're doing with that that are kind of exciting. And then there's, a, like Carlos mentioned, another group that's working on what those um, project management documents should look like consistently. Um, but you'll still be getting those notices that say, hey, your project is changed or we just found out that um, you know, steel has gone up so our estimates are being adjusted. Um, but until we get to that award and those bids, um, GSA does not require your signature to continue or your approval uh, to continue that uh, procurement process. We're going to move to getting that approval right where the, the rubber hits the road, where um, we are starting to sign documents that are committing the government and taxpayer dollars. And that's when we need um, to have you as an equal partner um, signing that or approving that OA. Um, and that's when those kind of risks and responsibilities kick in. Thanks. And then for those of you who aren't familiar with it, Kahua is GSA's new project management tool that, that we're releasing. And when you get your CPAs and, and that comes, uh, you, you'll actually be approving them or signing the, the CPAs in within Kahua. Thanks, Carlos. One more sort of nuts and bolts question. I think it's sort of an interesting one. So an agency has an active OA. Under the current system, if they want to do an expansion, they might do something that we would call an incremental OA. So they have like a new block of space. How is that going to look in Oasis? Because right now, a lot of times that just all gets blended together. Blended together. So we had a customer on the call that wants to know how that's going to look. That is a great question. Um, so much better than it does now would be my, my first response for how this is going to work. So you will have an OA. It will be kind of in that billing status today. You'll be able to see it in Oasis. You'll be able to see, yes, this is the amount of square footage and the rent I pay. So if we're going to do an expansion, you would get an updated notice that says there's going to be a change to your OA. And if it's for an expansion, you're going to have to approve it. So it would come over to you, the same OA number. You could see what is currently billing. And then you would also see that this is now proposing that the square footage go from 10,000 feet to 15,000 feet. Um, and then you would also see these are some new rent payment lines. Um, so if it was being done at a different rate, you would now see that, okay, here's the new 5,000 um, square feet. This is the proposed rate. And it would show up as pending. So it's not billing yet. If it was just going to be blended or not blended, but all at the same rental rate, you would see that there'd be a pending line that would show up that would show you what the rent will be, you know, 15,000 at, at the current rate. Um, once it's approved and once it's executed and you actually move into that expansion, um, that pending line would become and replace the current billing line. Um, so if there was a line that said 10,000, that line goes away and now um, it's replaced with that pending line that said 15,000. And you'll be able to track that, um, like I said, through the OA history and change analysis. So you can see I was paying 10, May 1st, I approved this expansion. Um, you know, June 1st, the project was done and we moved in. Um, that's a very quick project. Maybe you're taking the space as is, um, but you'll be able to follow that through. 
Um, we will not have versions for those that review always now. We will not have version numbers that skip around. So you won't sign uh, version five only to find out that version five never built and went away. And now, you know, you've gone from version four to version 14. Um, that situation goes away. So I think it's going to be a lot easier for you to track it. And for those of you that, that do audits or financial reviews, um, it's going to be a lot more transparent. So excellent question. Thanks. Um, we have one more. This is about user roles. So this is a, a sort of interesting situation. The question is, my agency only reviews the OAs for our clients. We do not sign them. To make sure I'm clear on the new system, will will we still need an OASIS account to review the OAs? This is about user roles, and I think it's a great opportunity to talk more about read-only and ordering official user roles. And I was muted. Um, <laughs> so yes, to get information out of OASIS, you will have to have a role. Um, in, in this particular situation, it sounds like a view-only role may be what's most appropriate. Um, there's still the functionality though, if they did not want you to be an Oasis that they could, again, download that PDF, um, save it, attach it and send it over to you and have you view it that way. It's a little bit less efficient um, and, and doesn't give you access to the data, but that's possible. Um, the other possibility is you can say, okay, we're all in here together. And um, like Lisa kind of walked through that example where um, maybe, you know, Mary Smith is the one in your agency who has the actual approval, um, but Mary Smith is not someone who's going to be an OASIS on a daily basis and is not um, going to be trained on, on a system. Um, you can set up a regional process where Mary Smith says, yes, I have approved this PDF. I've stamped it or signed it or whatever she, she would like to do. Um, and we're going to have um, Bob Jones hit that button. And we've, we've um, designated Bob as the person who can record that our agency has approved it. That is a possibility. It's really up to each individual agency how you want to structure that approval process um, and what kind of internal controls that you want to set up. Um, you will be able to see exactly who approved it, when people approved it. Um, so if, if Bob um, gets excited and starts approving anything and everything, um, you'll immediately be able to say, oh, we got we to gotta go talk to Bob, um, calm him down, or remove him from the tool. The agencies will have the ability um, to change user roles, uh, reassign work, or, or turn people in, on and off. Um, and Lisa, I don't know if you wanted to add more to that. And that was perfect. I just wanted um, to remind folks that they'll also have the ability to upload information related to that OA. So let's say you have a, a wet copy signature from your director, or there's an email or something that you want to record with that OA saying, yes, go ahead and hit that button, I approve. You can upload that to the OA and you'll be able to see that in association with the OA and so will everyone else um, in the future. So you have a way to kind of hit the approve, but also have a copy of the signed approval as well. Since we're talking about user roles, we just got a question that, that was touched on a moment ago, but I, I think maybe it's worth um, revisiting. Who at the agency will be asked to provide the list of users and the authority to modify it down the road? Also an excellent question. We are working to identify a point of contact for every single agency bureau code. Um, sometimes it's the same person for, for two or three, um, but that is going to be uh, the agency conduit right now for our information. Um, we started a very high CFO level with each agency and are kind of working our ways down as, as some of the CFOs have set up. Yeah, not me here, <laughs> past that potato. So we're getting those names together. Once we have those and have kind of finalized those, um, we will make that available to anyone that would like that information. Um, so if you're in an agency and you're not sure who you should be talking to about wanting OASIS access or whether you're the appropriate um, person to do that, you can look it up and, and see exactly who your point of contact is. Um, we're going to start reaching out to them in the fall to kind of discuss all of this and what this looks like and ask them to start vetting and putting together a list of names. I would anticipate for most agencies that's going to be a big lift and a collaborative process as you go through and, and kind of sort out um, who you want approving these and work through um, the way that you have been doing it in the past. 
And Lisa, did you want to add? That's okay. I just add on to it. That was perfect. Um, the ordering officials have to have a special license. So that's why we're kind of would be asking about them earlier and we need to know specific names. Um, but the other thing that happens is when you get to re your OASIS user request form, as an agency member, you're going to have to have your supervisor sign it. Um, and you, on that form, have to indicate what level of access you're requesting. So if it's read only, it'll be there. Um, if it is, say, later and you're adding an ordering official, um, you will need to have that supervisor's signature. There are things that we can check, such as, you know, if your email address has the right AB code and that sort of thing, we can't double check that your supervisor really does approve, but you will have to have somebody sign that. Um, so that way you will have an understanding of, oh, this person over here asked for an ordering official and they shouldn't be doing that. They should be read only. So I'm not gonna send this um, user request over to GSA. So hopefully that will make it a little easier uh, to be clear what people are gonna need. Uh, but we will ask for the ordering official names to start um, earlier. And then after that, you just ask for it when you ask for a user role. All right, thanks, Lisa. All right, our questions are starting to peter out. I have one open right now. I'm gonna ask that, or another very nuts and bolts question. And if you all do have any further questions, please put them in the Q&A pod. Um, otherwise, we're gonna wrap it up. The question is, will overtime utilities be processed through Oasis? Yes, the ones that are currently billed through the rent today will transition and bill through Oasis as well. So that will be um, the same that it is today, um, except for that you'll be able to see it in Oasis and kind of uh, drill down into those details. Um, I did want to mention, Stephanie, um, I noticed we had a lot of row questions um, and just do want to assure everyone, row is remaining the same. It will look the same. The format is not changing. The only difference in row um, is that the custom TI line will no longer populate. It'll all just be rolled into the general, but that won't change the look of it. You'll just notice that instead of um, you know, 10,000 in one and 100,000 in another, 110,000 will all be in one line. Um, otherwise, row is the same. If you have access today, you will continue to have access. Um, nothing there is changing, so. And then I saw a question on the, the chat just about a pricing desk guide. Um, it's gonna be the sixth edition that we have coming out. We're expecting to release that in October and we'll make sure to send that broadly through our customer engagement folks to, to our customers. That includes all the changes that, that we talked about today. And hopefully if, uh, I'm also hopeful that we'll improve the, in, increase the, the tenant improvement allowance because as you know, there's been a lot of uh, inflation with project costs, um, material price increases and, and labor shortages and, and whatnot. But uh, all of that uh, you should see shortly in that sixth edition around October. All right, and with the last of those questions wrapped up, aside from any that will be answered after this presentation, I will move toward ending things off with our last poll question. As a result of today's training, how much more informed do you feel about the spring 2023 implementation of OASIS? Option one, significantly more informed. You totally understand what to expect. Option two, more informed. It kind of makes sense now, but we'll see. Uh, option C, uh, about the same, you now have new questions and would like further clarification, or D, worse off. We lost you and uh, you definitely meet, need some more support with this transition. Well, the good news is very few of you are saying option D, um, but it looks like most people are feeling more informed, a little more comfortable um, and could maybe use a little more clarification in the future, but are in a good place right now. All right, well, thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, I want to give a huge thanks to our presenters for sharing their expertise. Uh, I'd also, and as well, I'd like to thank Stephanie for being an all-star answering all of those Q&A questions. And we'd also like to thank all of you, our clients, who are able to join us today and engage with the material. We hope that you enjoyed and found this presentation useful. Uh, we will be posting formal written responses to the questions and comments you posted in our Q&A panel as a frequently asked questions document for future reference on our website, 
www.gsa.gov slash CES. We host these client enrichment series presentations each month and cover a wide range of topics. Each presentation is led by an expert on the subject and can provide anywhere from a basic overview of a topic to a more advanced deep dive into the nitty gritty. Two of our upcoming sessions are, if you go to the next slide, please, uh, on the screen. Uh, our next one will be the Kahua Users Club on September 15th, 2022, uh, and Cost Estimating and Cost Management Principles on October 18th, 2022. Uh, we hope that you will be able to join us then. Uh, to learn more about the Client Enrichment Series as a whole, please visit our website. Again, that's www.gsa.gov slash CES. The goal of the Client Enrichment Series is to engage our audience in workplace topics that contribute to your mission success and to your effective management of your real estate and workplace programs. Thank you again for everyone who could join us today, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Bye-bye. Thank you. All right.